Chapter 7, Section 2 of Celebrated Crimes, Volume 2, The Massacres of the South. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Celebrated Crimes, Volume 2, The Massacres of the South, by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 7, Section 2. As soon as they were out of hearing, we began to consider our situation and weigh our chances. There was no use in going back to the captain's, for he was no longer there, having also succeeded in getting away. If we were to wander about the country, we should be recognized as fugitives, and the fate that awaited us as such was at the moment brought home to us, for a few yards away we suddenly heard the shrieks of a man who was being murdered. They were the first cries of agony I had ever heard, and for a few moments, I confess, I was frozen with terror. But soon a violent reaction took place within me, and I felt that it would be better to march straight to meet peril than to await its coming, and although I knew the danger of trying to go through St. Just again, I resolved to risk it, and to get to Marseilles at all costs, so turning to Monsieur, I said, You can remain here without danger until the evening, but I am going to Marseilles at once, for I cannot endure this uncertainty any longer, if I find St. Just clear, I shall come back and rejoin you, but if not, I shall get away as best I can alone. Knowing the danger that we were running, and how little chance there was that we should ever see each other again, he held out his hand to me, but I threw myself into his arms and gave him a last embrace. I started at once when I reached St. Just. I found the freebooters still there, so I walked up to them, trolling a melody, but one of them seized me by the collar, and two others took aim at me with their musket. If ever in my life I shouted, Long live the king, with less enthusiasm than the cry deserves, it was then. To assume a rollicking air, to laugh with cool carelessness, when there is nothing between you and death but the more or less strong pressure of a highwayman's finger on the trigger of a musket, is no easy task. But all this I accomplished, and once more got through the village with a whole skin indeed, but with the unalterable resolution to blow my brains out rather than again try such an experiment. Having now a village behind me which I had vowed never to re-enter, and there being no road available by which I could hope to get round Marseilles, the only course open to me was to make my way into the city. At that moment this was a thing of difficulty, for many small bodies of troops wearing the white cockade infested the approaches. I soon perceived that the danger of getting in was as great as ever, so I determined to walk up and down till night, hoping the darkness would come to my aid but one of the patrols soon gave me to understand that my prowling about had aroused suspicion and ordered me either to go on to the city in which by all accounts there was small chance of safety for me or back to the village where certain death awaited me a happy inspiration flashed across my mind i would get some refreshment and seeing an inn nearby i went in and ordered a mug of beer sitting down near the window faintly hoping that before the necessity for a final decision arrived someone who knew me would pass by after waiting half an hour i did indeed see an acquaintance no other than monsieur whom i had left in the vineyard i beckoned him and he joined me he told me that being too impatient to await my return he had soon made up his mind to follow me and by joining a band of pillagers was lucky enough to get safely through st just we consulted together as to what we had better do next and having applied to our host found he could supply us with a trusty messenger who would carry the news of our whereabouts to my brother-in-law after an anxious wait of three hours we saw him coming i was about to run out to meet him but monsieur held me back pointing out the danger of such a step so we sat still our eyes fixed on the approaching figure but when my brother-in-law reached the inn i could restrain my impatience no longer but rushing out of the room met him on the stairs my wife i cried have you seen my wife she is at my house was the reply and with a cry of joy i threw myself into his arms my wife who had been threatened insulted and roughly treated because of my opinions had indeed found safety at my brother-in-law's night was coming on my brother-in-law who wore the uniform of the national guard which was at the moment a safeguard took us each by an arm and we passed the barrier without anyone asking us who we were choosing quiet streets we reached his house unmolested but in fact the whole city was quiet, for the carnage was practically at an end. My wife's safe! This thought filled my heart with joy almost too great to bear. Her adventures were the following. 
My wife and her mother had gone to our house as agreed upon to pack our trunks. As they left their rooms, having accomplished their task, they found the landlady waiting on the staircase who had once overwhelmed my wife with a torrent of abuse. The husband, who until then had known nothing of their tenant's return, hearing the noise, came out of his room and seizing his wife by the arm, pulled her in and shut the door. She, however, rushed to the window and just as my wife and her mother reached the street, shouted to a free band who were on guard across the way, Fire! They are Bonapartists! Fortunately, the men, more merciful than the woman, seeing two ladies quite alone, did not hinder their passage, and as just then my brother-in-law came by, whose opinions were well known and whose uniform was respected, he was allowed to take them under his protection and conduct them to his house in safety. A young man employed at the prefecture, who had called at my house the day before, I having promised to help him in editing the journal de Boucher de Rhone, was not so lucky. His occupation and his visit to me laid him under suspicion of possessing dangerous opinions, and his friends urged him to fly, but it was too late. He was attacked at the corner of the Rue de Noailles, and fell wounded by a stab from a dagger. Happily, however, he ultimately recovered. The whole day was passed in the commission of deeds still more bloody than those of the day before. The sewers ran blood, and every hundred yards a dead body was to be met. But this sight, instead of satiating the thirst for blood of the assassins, only seemed to awaken a general feeling of gaiety. In the evening the streets resounded with song and roundelay, and for many a year to come that which we looked back on as the day of the massacre lived in the memory of the royalists as the day of the farce. As we felt we could not live any longer in the midst of such scenes, even though as far as we were concerned all danger was over, we set out for Nimes that same evening, having been offered the use of a carriage. Nothing worthy of note happened on the road to Orgon, which we reached next day, but the isolated detachments of troops which we passed from time to time reminded us that the tranquillity was nowhere perfect. As we neared the town we saw three men going about arm in arm. This friendliness seemed strange to us after our recent experiences, for one of them wore a white cockade, the second a tricolor, and the third none at all and yet they went about on the most brotherly terms, each awaiting under a different banner the outcome of events. Their wisdom impressed me much, and feeling I had nothing to fear from such philosophers, I went up to them and questioned them, and they explained their hopes to me with the greatest innocence, and above all their firm determination to belong to whatever party got the upper hand. As we drove into Orgon, we saw at a glance that the whole town was simmering with excitement. Everybody's face expressed anxiety, a man who, we were told, was the mayor, was haranguing a group. As everyone was listening, with the greatest attention we drew near, and asked them the cause of the excitement. Gentlemen, said he, you ought to know the news. The king is in his capital, and we have once more hoisted the white flag, and there has not been a single dispute to mar the tranquillity of the day. One party has triumphed without violence, and the other has submitted with resignation but I have just learned that a band of vagabonds numbering about three hundred have assembled on the bridge over the Durance, and are preparing to raid our little town tonight, intending by pillage or extortion to get at what we possess. I have a few guns left which I am about to distribute, and each man will watch over the safety of all. Although he had not enough arms to go round, he offered to supply us, but as I had my double-barreled pistols, I did not deprive him of his weapons, I made the ladies go to bed, and sitting at their door, tried to sleep as well as I could, a pistol in each hand. But at every instant the noise of a false alarm sounded through the town, and when day dawned my only consolation was that no one else in Orgon had slept any better than I. The next day we continued our journey to Tarascon, where new excitements awaited us. As we got near the town we heard the tocsin clanging and drums beating the generale, we were so accustomed to the uproar that we were not very much astonished. However, when we got in, we asked what was going on, and we were told that twelve thousand troops from Nimes had marched on Beaucaire and laid it waste with fire and sword. I insinuated that twelve thousand men was a rather large number for one town to furnish, but was told that that included troops from the Gardonique and the Cévennes. Nimes still clung to the tricolor. But Beaucaire had hoisted the white flag, and it was for the purpose of pulling it down and scattering the royalists who were assembling in numbers at Beaucaire that Nimes had sent forth her troops on this expedition. 
Seeing that Tarascon and Beaucaire are only separated by the Rhone, it struck me as peculiar that such quiet should prevail on one bank while such fierce conflict was raging on the other. I did not doubt that something had happened, but not an event of such gravity as was reported. We therefore decided to push on to Beaucaire, and when we got there we found the town in the most perfect order. The expedition of twelve thousand men was reduced to one of two hundred, which had been easily repulsed with the result that of the assailants one had been wounded and one made prisoner. Proud of this success, the people of Beaucaire entrusted us with a thousand objurgations to deliver to their inveterate enemies the citizens of Nimes. If any journey could give a correct idea of the preparations for civil war and the confusion which already prevailed in the South, I should think that without contradiction it would be that which we took that day. Along the four leagues which lie between Beaucaire and Nimes, were posted at frequent intervals detachments of troops, displaying alternately the white and the tricolored cockade. Every village upon our route, except those just outside of Nimes, had definitely joined either one party or the other, and the soldiers who were stationed at equal distances along the road were now royalist and now bonapartist. Before leaving Beaucaire we had all provided ourselves, taking example by the men we had seen at Orgon, with two cockades, one white and one tricolored, and by peeping out from the carriage windows, we were able to see which was worn by the troops. We were approaching in time to attach a similar one to our hats before we got up to them, whilst we hid the other in our shoes. Then as we were passing, we stuck our heads, decorated according to the circumstances, out of the windows and shouted vigorously, Long live the king, or long live the emperor, as the case demanded. Thanks to this concession, to political opinions on the highway, and in no less degree to the money which we gave by way of tips to everybody everywhere, we arrived at length at the barriers of Nimes, where we came up with the National Guards who had been repulsed by the townspeople of Beaucaire. This is what had taken place just before we arrived in the city. The National Guard of Nimes, and the troops of which the garrison was composed, had resolved to unite in giving a banquet on Sunday, the 28th of June, to celebrate the success of the French army. The news of the Battle of Waterloo travelled much more quickly to Marseille than to Nimes, so the banquet took place without interruption. A bust of Napoleon was carried in procession all over the town, and then the regular soldiers and the National Guard devoted the rest of the day to rejoicings which were followed by no excess. But the day was not quite finished before news came that numerous meetings were taking place at Beaucaire. So although the news of the defeat at Waterloo reached Nimes on the following Tuesday, the troops which we had seen returning to the gates of the city had been dispatched on Wednesday to disperse these assemblies. Meantime, the Bonapartists, under the command of General Gilly, amongst whom was a regiment of chasseurs, beginning to despair of the success of their cause, felt that their situation was becoming very critical especially as they learnt that the forces at Beaucaire had assumed the offensive and were about to march upon Nimes. As I had had no connection with anything that had taken place in the capital of the guard, I personally had nothing to fear, but having learned by experience how easily suspicions arise, I was afraid that the ill luck, which had not spared either my friends or my family, might lead to their being accused of having received a refugee from Marseilles, a word in which itself had small significance but which in the mouth of an enemy might be fatal. Fears for the future being thus aroused by my recollections of the past, I decided to give up the contemplation of a drama which might become redoubtable, asked to bury myself in the country with the firm intention of coming back to Nimes as soon as the white flag should once more float from its towers. An old castle in the Cévennes, which from the days when the Albigenses were burnt down to the massacre of La Bagara, had witnessed many a revolution and counter-revolution became the asylum of my wife, my mother, Monsieur, and myself. As the peaceful tranquillity of our life there was unbroken by any event of interest, I shall not pause to dwell on it, but at length we grew weary, for such as man, of our life of calm, and being left once for nearly a week without any news from outside, we made that an excuse for returning to Nimes, in order to see with our own eyes how things were going on. When we were about two leagues on our way, we met the carriage of a friend, a rich landed proprietor from the city, seeing that he was in it. I alighted to ask him what was happening in Nimes. I hope you do not think of going there, said he, especially at this moment. The excitement is intense. Blood has already flowed, and catastrophe is imminent. 
so back we went to our mountain castle but in a few days became again a prey to the same restlessness and not being able to overcome it decided to go at all risks and see for ourselves the condition of affairs and this time neither advice nor warning having any effect we not only set out but we arrived at our destination the same evening we had not been misinformed phrase having already taken place in the streets which had heated public opinion one man had been killed on the esplanada by a musket shot and it seemed as if his death would be only the forerunner of many the catholics were awaiting with impatience the arrival of those doughty warriors from beaucaire on whom they placed their chief reliance the protestants went about in painful silence and fear blanched every face at length the white flag was hoisted and the king proclaimed without any of the disorders which had been dreaded taking place but it was plainly visible that this calm was only a pause before a struggle and that on the slightest pretext the pent-up passions would break loose again just at this time the memory of our quiet life in the mountains inspired us with a happy idea we had learned that the obstinate resolution of marshal bruna never to acknowledge louis the eighteenth as king had been softened and that the marshal had been induced to hoist the white flag at toulon while with a cockade in his hat he had formally resigned the command of that place into the hands of the royal authorities henceforward in all the province there was no spot where he could live unmarked his ultimate intentions were unknown to us indeed his movements seemed to show great hesitation on his part so it occurred to us to offer him our little country house as a refuge where he could await the arrival of more peaceful times we decided that monsieur and another friend of ours who had just arrived from paris should go to him and make the offer which he would at once accept all the more readily because it came from the hearts which were deeply devoted to him they set out but to my great surprise returned the same day they brought us word that marshal bruna had been assassinated at avignon at first we could not believe the dreadful news and took it for one of these ghastly rumors which circulate with such rapidity during periods of civil strife but we were not left long in uncertainty for the details of the catastrophe arrived all too soon end of chapter seven section two reading by john van stan savannah georgia chapter eight of celebrated crimes volume two the massacres of the south this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Celebrated Crimes, Volume 2, The Massacres of the South by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 8. For some days Avignon had its assassins, as Marseille had had them, and as Nimes was about to have them. For some days all Avignon shuddered at the names of five men, Pointu, Fargus, Roquefort, Naudad, and Magnon. Pointu was a perfect type of the men of the South, olive-skinned and eagle-eyed, with a hook nose and teeth of ivory. Although he was hardly above middle height, and his back was bent from bearing heavy burdens, his legs bowed by the pressure of the enormous masses which he daily carried, he was yet possessed of extraordinary strength and dexterity. He could throw over the Lule gate a forty-eight-pound cannonball as easily as a child could throw its ball. He could fling a stone from one bank of the Rhone to the other where it was two hundred yards wide, and lastly, he could throw a knife backwards while running at full speed with such strength and precision of aim that this new kind of Parthian arrow would go whistling through the air to hide two inches of its iron head in a tree trunk, no thicker than a man's thigh. When to these accomplishments are added an equal skill with the musket, the pistol, and the quarter-staff, a good deal of mother-wit, a deep hatred for republicans against whom he had vowed vengeance at the foot of the scaffold on which his father and mother had perished an idea can be formed of the terrible chief of the assassins of avignon who had for his lieutenants fargus the silk weaver roquefort the porter naudad the baker and magnon the second-hand clothes dealer avignon was entirely in the power of these five men whose brutal conduct the civil and military authorities would not or could not repress when word came that Marshal Brune, who was at Luc in command of six thousand troops, had been summoned to Paris to give an account of his conduct to the new government. The Marshal, knowing the state of intense excitement which prevailed in the South, and foreseeing the perils likely to meet him on the road, asked permission to travel by water, 
but met with an official refusal and the duc de riviere governor of marseilles furnished him with a safe conduct the cutthroats bellowed with joy when they learned that a republican of eighty nine who had risen to the rank of marshal under the usurper was about to pass through avignon at the same time sinister reports began to run from mouth to mouth the harbingers of death once more the infamous slander which a hundred times had been proved to be false raised its voice with dogged persistence asserting that bruna who did not arrive at paris until the fifth of september seventeen ninety two had on the second when still at lyon carried the head of the princess de lamballe impaled on a pike soon the news came that the marshal had just escaped assassination at Aix. indeed he owed his safety to the fleetness of his horses pointu forges and roquefort swore that they would manage things better at avignon by the route which the marshal had chosen there were only two ways open by which he could reach lyon he must either pass through avignon or avoid it by taking a crossroad which branched off at the pointet highway two leagues outside the town the assassins thought that he would take the latter course and on the second of august the day on which the marshal was expected pointu magnon and naudaud with four of their creatures took a carriage at six o'clock in the morning and setting out from the rhone bridge hid themselves by the side of the high road to pointet when the marshal reached the point where the road divided having been warned of the hostile feelings so rife in avignon he decided to take the cross-road upon which pointu and his men were awaiting him but the postillion obstinately refused to drive in this direction saying that he always changed horses at avignon and not at pointet one of the marshal's aide-de-camp tried pistol in hand to force him to obey but the marshal would permit no violence to be offered him and gave him orders to go on to avignon the marshal reached the town at nine o'clock in the morning and alighted at the hotel de palais royal which was also the post-house while fresh horses were being put to and the passports and safe conduct examined at the lule gate the marshal entered the hotel to take a plate of soup in less than five minutes a crowd gathered round the door and monsieur moulin the proprietor noticing the sinister and threatening expression many of the faces bore went to the marshal's room and urged him to leave instantly without waiting for his papers pledging his word that he would send a man on horseback after him who would overtake him two or three leagues beyond the town and bring him his own safe conduct and the passports of his aide-de-camp the marshal came downstairs and finding the horses ready got into the carriage on which loud murmurs arose from the populace amongst which could be distinguished the word zao that excited cry of the provincial which according to the tone in which it is uttered expresses every shade of threat and which means at once in a single syllable bite rend kill murder the marshal set out at a gallop and passed the town gates unmolested except by the howlings of the populace who however made no attempt to stop him he thought he had left all his enemies behind but when he reached the rhone bridge he found a group of men armed with muskets waiting there led by fargus and roquefort they all raised their guns and took aim at the marshal who thereupon ordered the postillion to drive back the order was obeyed but when the carriage had gone about fifty yards it was met by a crowd from the palais royal which had followed it so the postillion stopped in a moment the traces were cut whereupon the marshal opening the door alighted followed by his valet and passing on foot through the lule gate followed by a second carriage in which were his aide-de-camp he regained the palais royal the doors of which were opened to him and his suite and immediately secured against all others the marshal asked to be shown to a room and monsieur moulin gave him number one to the front in ten minutes three thousand people filled the square it was as if the population sprang up from the ground just then the carriage which the marshal had left behind came up the postillion having tied the traces and a second time the great yard gates were opened and in spite of the press closed again and barricaded by the porter fernet and monsieur moulin himself both of whom were men of colossal strength the aide-de-camp who had remained in the carriage until then now alighted and asked to be shown to the marshal but moulin ordered the porter to conceal them in an outhouse fernet taking one in each hand dragged them off despite their struggles and pushing them behind some empty barrels over which he threw an old piece of carpet said to them in a voice as solemn as if he were a prophet if you move you are dead men and left them the aide-de-camp remained there motionless and silent 
At that moment, Monsieur de saint Chamon, prefect of Avignon, who had arrived in town at five o'clock in the morning, came out into the courtyard. By this time, the crowd was smashing the windows and breaking in the street door. The square was full to overflowing. Everywhere, threatening cries were heard, and above all, the terrible zow, from which, moment to moment, became more full of menace. Monsieur Moulin saw that if they could not hold out until the troops under Major Lambeau arrived, all was lost. He therefore told Fernet to settle the business of those who were breaking in the door, while he would take charge of those who were trying to get in at the window. Thus these two men, moved by a common impulse and of equal courage, undertook to dispute with a howling mob the possession of the blood for which it thirsted. Both dashed to their posts, one in the hall, the other in the dining room, and found door and windows already smashed and several men in the house. At the sight of Fernet, with whose immense strength they were acquainted, those in the hall drew back a step, and Fernet, taking advantage of this moment, succeeded in ejecting them and in securing the door once more. Meantime, Monsieur Moulin, seizing his double-barreled gun which stood in the chimney corner, pointed it at five men who had got into the dining room and threatened to fire if they did not instantly get out again. Four obeyed, but one refused to budge, whereupon Moulin, finding himself no longer outnumbered, laid aside his gun, and seizing his adversary round the waist, lifted him as if he were a child and flung him out of the window. The man died three weeks later, not from the fall, but from the squeeze. Moulin then dashed to the window to secure it, but as he laid his hand on it he felt his head seized from behind and pressed violently down on his left shoulder. At the same instant a pane was broken into splinters, and the head of a hatchet struck his right shoulder. Monsieur de saint Chamon, who had followed him into the room, had seen the weapon thrown at Moulin's head, and not being able to turn aside the iron, had turned aside the object at which it was aimed. Moulin seized the hatchet by the handle, and tore it out of the hands of him who had delivered the blow, which fortunately had missed its aim. He then finished closing the window and secured it by making fast the inside shutters, and went upstairs to see after the marshal. Him he found striding up and down his room, his handsome and noble face as calm as if the voices of all those shouting men outside were not demanding his death. Moulin made him leave number one for number three, which being a back room and looking out on the courtyard seemed to offer more chances of safety than the other. The marshal asked for writing materials which Moulin brought, whereupon the marshal sat down at a little table and began to write. Just then the cries outside became still more uproarious. Monsieur de saint Chamon had gone out and ordered the crowd to disperse, whereupon a thousand people had answered him with one voice, asking who he was that he should give such an order. He announced his rank and authority, to which the answer was, We only know the prefect by his clothes. Now it had unfortunately happened that Monsieur de Chamon, having sent his trunks by diligence, they had not yet arrived, and being dressed in a green coat, nankeen trousers, and a peak vest, it could hardly be expected that in such a suit he should overawe the people under the circumstances. So when he got up on a bench to harangue the populace, cries arose of, Down with the green coat! We have enough of charlatans like that. And he was forced to get down again. As Fernet opened the door to let him in, several men took advantage of the circumstance to push in along with him, but Fernet let his fist fall three times, and three men rolled at his feet like bulls struck by a club. The others withdrew. A dozen champions such as Fernet would have saved the marshal. Yet it must not be forgotten that this man was a royalist and held the same opinions as those against whom he fought. For him, as for them, the marshal was a mortal enemy, but he had a noble heart, and if the marshal were guilty he desired a trial and not a murder. Meantime a certain onlooker had heard what had been said to Monsieur de Chaman about his unofficial costume, and had gone to put on his uniform. This was Monsieur de P., a handsome and venerable old man with white hair, pleasant expression, and winning voice. He soon came back in his mayor's robes, wearing his scarf and his double cross of St. Louis and the Legion of Honor. But neither his age nor his dignity made the slightest impression on these people. They did not even allow him to get back to the hotel door, but knocked him down and trampled him underfoot, so that he hardly escaped with torn clothes and his white hair covered with dust and blood. The fury of the mob had now reached its height. At this juncture the garrison of Avignon came in sight. It was composed of four hundred volunteers who formed a battalion known as the Royal Angulema. 
it was commanded by a man who had assumed the title of lieutenant general of the emancipating army of vaucluse these forces drew up under the windows of the palais royal they were composed almost entirely of provenceaux and spoke the same dialect as the people of the lower orders the crowd asked the soldiers for what they had come why they did not leave them to accomplish an act of justice in peace and if they intended to interfere quite the contrary said one of the soldiers pitch him out of the window and we will catch him on the points of our bayonets brutal cries of joy greeted this answer succeeded by a short silence but it was easy to see that under the apparent calm the crowd was in a state of eager expectation soon new shouts were heard but this time from the interior of the hotel a small band of men led by forges and roquefort had separated themselves from the throng and by the help of ladders had scaled the walls and got on the roof of the house and gliding down the other side had dropped into the balcony outside the windows of the rooms where the marshal was writing some of these dashed through the windows without waiting to open them others rushed in at the open door the marshal thus taken by surprise rose and not wishing that the letter he was writing to the austrian commandant to claim his protection should fall into the hands of these wretches he tore it to pieces then a man who belonged to a better class than the others and who wears to-day the cross of the legion of honor granted to him perhaps for his conduct on this occasion advanced towards the marshal sword in hand and told him if he had any last arrangements to make he should make them at once for he had only ten minutes to live what are you thinking of exclaimed forges ten minutes did he give the princess de lamballe ten minutes and he pointed his pistol at the marshal's breast but the marshal striking up the weapon the shot missed its aim and buried itself in the ceiling clumsy fellow said the marshal shrugging his shoulders not to be able to kill a man at such a close range that's true replied roquefort in his patois i'll show you how to do it and receding a step he took aim with his carbine at his victim whose back was partly towards him a report was heard and the marshal fell dead on the spot the bullet which entered at the shoulder going right through his body and striking the opposite wall the two shots which had been heard in the street made the howling mob dance for joy one cowardly fellow called catalan rushed out on one of the balconies which looked on the square and holding a loaded pistol in each hand which he had not dared to discharge even into the dead body of the murdered man he cut a caper and holding up the innocent weapons called out these have done the business but he lied the braggart and boasted of a crime which was committed by braver cutthroats than he behind him came the general of the emancipating army of vaucluse who graciously saluting the crowd said the marshal has carried out an act of justice by taking his own life shouts of mingled joy revenge and hatred rose from the crowd and the king's attorney and the examining magistrate set about drawing up a report of the suicide now that all was over and there was no longer any question of saving the marshal monsieur moulin desired at least to save the valuables which he had in his carriage he found in a cash box forty thousand francs in the pockets a snuff box set with diamonds and a pair of pistols and two swords the hilt of one of these latter was studded with precious stones a gift from the ill-starred selim monsieur moulin returned across the court carrying these things the damascus blade was wrenched from his hands and the robber kept it five years as a trophy and it was not until the year eighteen twenty that he was forced to give it up to the representative of the marshal's widow yet this man was an officer and kept his rank all through the restoration and was not dismissed the army till eighteen thirty when monsieur moulin had placed the other objects in safety he requested the magistrate to have the corpse removed as he wished the crowds to disperse that he might look after the aide-de-camp while they were undressing the marshal in order to certify the cause of death a leathern belt was found on him containing five thousand five hundred and thirty-six francs the body was carried downstairs by the grave-diggers without any opposition being offered but hardly had they advanced ten yards into the square when shouts of to the rhone to the rhone resounded on all sides a police officer who tried to interfere was knocked down the bearers were ordered to turn round they obeyed and the crowd carried them off towards the wooden bridge when the fourteenth arch was reached the beer was torn from the bearer's hands and the corpse was flung into the river military honors shouted some one and all who had guns fired at the dead body which was twice struck tomb of marshal brune was then written on the arch and the crowd withdrew and passed the rest of the day in holiday-making
Meanwhile, the roan, refusing to be an accomplice in such a crime, bore away the corpse which the assassins believed had been swallowed up forever. Next day it was found on the sandy shore at Tarascon, but the news of the murder had preceded it, and it was recognized by the wounds, and pushed back again into the waters which bore it toward the sea. Three leagues farther on it stopped again, this time by a grassy bank, and was found by a man of forty and another of eighteen. They also recognized it, but instead of shoving it back into the current, they drew it up gently on the bank and carried it to a small property belonging to one of them, where they reverently interred it. The elder of the two was Monsieur de Chartreuse, the younger Monsieur Amade Pichot. The body was exhumed by order of the marshal's widow, and brought to her castle of St. Just in Champagne. She had it embalmed and placed in a bedroom adjoining her own, where it remained, covered only by a veil, until the memory of the deceased was cleansed from the accusation of suicide by a solemn public trial and judgment. Then only it was finally interred, along with the parchment containing the decision of the court of Riom. The ruffians who killed Marshal Bruna, although they evaded the justice of men, did not escape the vengeance of God. Nearly every one of them came to a miserable end. Roquefort and Fargus were attacked by strange and hitherto unknown diseases, recalling the plagues sent by God on the peoples whom he desired to punish in bygone ages. In the case of Fargus, his skin dried up and became horny, causing him such intense irritation that as the only means of allaying it he had to be kept buried up to the neck while still alive. The disease under which Roquefort suffered seemed to have its seat in the marrow, for his bones by degrees lost all solidity and power of resistance, so that his limbs refused to bear his weight, and he went about the streets crawling like a serpent. Both died in such dreadful torture that they regretted having escaped the scaffold, which would have spared them such prolonged agony. Pointu was condemned to death in his absence at the Assises court of La Drome for having murdered five people and was cast off by his own faction. For some time his wife, who was infirm and deformed, might be seen going from house to house asking alms for him, who had been for two months the arbiter of civil war and assassination. Then came a day when she ceased her quest, and was seen sitting her head covered by a black rag. Pointu was dead, but it was never known where or how. In some corner, probably in the crevice of a rock or in the heart of the forest, like an old tiger whose talons have been clipped and his teeth drawn. Naudad and Magnon were sentenced to the galleys for ten years. Naudad died there, but Magnon finished his time and then became a scavenger, and faithful to his vocation as a dealer of death, a poisoner of stray dogs. Some of these cutthroats are still living and fill good positions, wearing crosses and epaulettes, and rejoicing in their impunity, imagining they have escaped the eye of God. We shall wait and see. End of chapter 8 Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia Chapter 9 of Celebrated Crimes, Volume 2, The Massacres of the South. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Celebrated Crimes, Volume 2, The Massacres of the South, by Alexander Dumas. It was on Saturday that the white flag was hoisted at Nimes. The next day a crowd of Catholic peasants from the environs marched into the city to await the arrival of the royalist army from Beaucaire. Excitement was at fever heat, the desire of revenge filled every breast, the hereditary hatred which had slumbered during the empire again awoke stronger than ever. Here I may pause to say that in the account which follows of the events which took place about this time, I can only guarantee the facts and not the dates. I relate everything as it happened, but the day on which it happened may sometimes have escaped my memory, for it is easier to recollect a murder to which one has been an eyewitness than to recall the exact date on which it happened. The garrison of Nimes was composed of one battalion of the 13th Regiment of the Line, and another battalion of the 79th Regiment, which not being up to its full war strength, had been sent to Nimes to complete its numbers by enlistment. 
but after the battle of waterloo the citizens had tried to induce the soldiers to desert so that of the two battalions even counting the officers only about two hundred men remained when the news of the proclamation of napoleon the second reached nimes brigadier general maumont commandant of the department had him proclaimed in the city without any disturbance being caused thereby it was not until some days later that a report began to be circulated that a royal army was gathering at beaucaire and that the populace would take advantage of its arrival to indulge in excesses in the face of this twofold danger general maumont had ordered the regular troops and a part of the national guard of the hundred days to be drawn up under arms in the rear of the barracks upon an eminence on which he had mounted five pieces of ordnance this disposition was maintained for two days and a night but as the populace remained quiet the troops returned to the barracks and the guards to their homes but on monday a concourse of people who had heard that the army from beaucaire would arrive the next day made a hostile demonstration before the barracks demanding with shouts and threats that the five cannons should be handed over to them the general and the officers who were quartered in the town hearing of the tumult repaired at once to the barracks but soon came out again and approaching the crowd tried to persuade it to disperse to which the only answer they received was a shower of bullets convinced by this as he was well acquainted with the character of the people with whom he had to deal that the struggle had begun in earnest and must be fought out to the bitter end the general retreated with his officers step by step to the barracks and having got inside the gates closed and bolted them he then decided that it was his duty to repulse force by force for every one was determined to defend and no matter what the cost a position which from the first moment of revolt was fraught with such peril so without waiting for orders the soldiers seeing that some of their windows had been broken by shots from without returned the fire and being better marksmen than the townspeople soon laid many low upon this the alarmed crowd retired out of musket range and entrenched themselves in some neighboring houses about nine o'clock in the evening a man bearing something resembling a white flag approached the walls and asked to speak to the general he brought a message inquiring on what terms the troops would consent to evacuate nimes the general sent back word that the conditions were that the troops should be allowed to march out fully armed and with all their baggage the five guns alone would be left behind when the forces reached a certain valley outside the city they would halt that the men might be supplied with means sufficient to enable them either to rejoin the regiments to which they belonged or to return to their homes at two o'clock a m the same envoy returned and announced to the general that the conditions had been accepted with one alteration which was that the troops before marching out should lay down their arms the messenger also intimated that if the offer he had brought were not quickly accepted say within two hours the time for capitulation would have gone by and that he would not be answerable for what the people might then do in their fury the general accepted the conditions as amended and the envoy disappeared when the troops heard of the agreement that they should be disarmed before being allowed to leave the town their first impulse was to refuse to lay down their weapons before a rabble which had run away from a few musket shots but the general succeeded in soothing their sense of humiliation and winning their consent by representing to them that there could be nothing dishonorable in an action which prevented the children of a common fatherland from shedding each other's blood the gendarmerie according to one article of the treaty were to close in at the rear of the evacuating column and thus hinder the populace from molesting the troops of which it was composed this was the only concession obtained in return for the abandoned arms and the farce in question was already drawn up in field order apparently waiting to escort the troops out of the city at four o'clock p m the troops got ready each company stacking its arms in the courtyard before marching out but hardly had forty or fifty men passed the gates than fire was opened on them at such close range that half of them were killed or disabled at the first volley upon this those who were still within the walls closed the courtyard gates thus cutting off all chance of retreat from their comrades in the event however it turned out that several of the latter contrived to escape with their lives and that they lost nothing through being prevented from returning for as soon as the mob saw that ten or twelve of their victims had slipped through their hands they made a furious attack on the barracks burst in the gates and scaled the walls with such rapidity that the soldiers had no time to repossess themselves of their muskets 
and even had they succeeded in seizing them, they would have been of little use, as ammunition was totally wanting. The barracks being thus carried by assault, a horrible massacre ensued which lasted for three hours. Some of the wretched men, being hunted from room to room, jumped out of the first window they could reach without stopping to measure its height from the ground, and were either impaled on the bayonets held in readiness below, or falling on the pavement broke their limbs and were pitilessly dispatched. The gendarme, who had really been called out to protect the retreat of the garrison, seemed to imagine they were there to witness a judicial execution, and stood immovable and impassive while these horrid deeds went on before their eyes. But the penalty of this indifference was swiftly exacted, for as soon as the soldiers were all done with, the mob, finding their thirst for blood still unslacked, turned on the gendarme, the greater number of whom were wounded while all lost their horses and some their lives. The populace was still engaged at its bloody task when the news came that the army from Beaucaire was within sight of the town, and the murderers, hastening to dispatch some of the wounded who still showed signs of life, went forth to meet the long-expected reinforcements. Only those who saw the advancing army with their own eyes can form any idea of its condition and appearance, the first corps excepted. This corps was commanded by Monsieur de Barre, who had put himself at its head with the noble purpose of preventing as far as he could massacre and pillage. In this he was seconded by the officers under him, who were actuated by the same philanthropic motives as their general in identifying themselves with the corps. Owing to their exertions, the men advanced in fairly regular order, and good discipline was maintained. All the men carried muskets. But the first corps was only a kind of vanguard to the second, which was the real army, and a wonderful thing to see and hear. Never were brought together before or since so many different kinds of howl, so many threats of death so many rags so many odd weapons from the matchlock of the time of the michelada to the steel-tipped goad of the bullcock drovers of la camargue so that when the nimes mob which in all conscience was howling and ragged enough rushed out to offer a brotherly welcome to the strangers its first feeling was one of astonishment and dismay as it caught sight of the motley crew which held out to it the right hand of fellowship the newcomers soon showed that it was through necessity and not choice that their outer man presented such a disreputable appearance for they were hardly well within the gates before demanding that the houses of the members of the old protestant national guard should be pointed out to them this being done they promptly proceeded to exact from each household a musket a coat a complete kit or a sum of money according to their humour so that before evening those who had arrived naked and penniless were provided with complete uniforms and had money in their pockets. These exactions were levied under the name of a contribution, but before the day was ended naked and undisguised pillage began. Someone asserted that during the assault on the barracks a certain individual had fired out of a certain house on the assailants. The indignant people now rushed to the house indicated and soon left nothing of it in existence but its walls. A little later it was clearly proved that the individual accused was quite innocent of the crime laid to his charge. The house of a rich merchant lay in the path of the advancing army. A cry arose that the owner was a Bonapartist and nothing more was needed. The house was broken into and pillaged and the furniture thrown out of the windows. Two days later it turned out that not only was the merchant no Bonapartist, but that his son had been one of those who had accompanied the Duke d'Angoulême to set when he left the country. The pillagers excused themselves by saying they had been misled by a resemblance between two names, and this excuse, as far as appears, was accepted as valid by the authorities. It was not long before the populace of Nimes began to think they might as well follow the example set them by their brothers from Beaucaire. In twenty-four hours, free companies were formed, headed by Trestaillon, Truffigny, Graffan, and Morinet, these bands arrogated to themselves the title of National Guard, and then what took place at Marseilles in the excitement of the moment was repeated at Nimes with deliberation and method, inspired by hate and the desire of vengeance. A revolt broke out which followed the ordinary course, first pillage, then fire, then murder, laid waste the city. Monsieur V's house, which stood in the middle of the town, was sacked and then burnt to the ground without a hand being raised to prevent the crime monsieur t s house on the road to montpellier 
was sacked and wrecked and a bonfire made of the furniture round which the crowd danced as if it had been an occasion of public rejoicing then cries were raised for the proprietor that he might be killed and as he could not be found the baffled fury of the mob vented itself on the dead a child three months buried was dragged from its grave drawn by the feet through the sewers and wayside puddles and then flung on a dung heap and strange to say while incendiarism and sacrilege thus ran riot the mayor of the place slept so sound that when he awoke he was quite astonished to use his own expression to hear what had taken place during the night this expedition completed the same company which had brought this expedition to a successful issue next turned their attention to a small country house occupied by a widow whom i had often begged to take refuge with us but secure in her insignificance she had always declined our offers preferring to live solitary and retired in her own home but the freebooters sought her out burst in her doors drove her away with blows and insults destroyed her house and burnt her furniture they then proceeded to the vault in which lay the remains of her family dragged them out of their coffins and scattered them about the fields the next day the poor woman ventured back collected the desecrated remains with pious care and replaced them in the vault but this was counted to her as a crime the company returned once more cast forth the contents of the coffins and threatened to kill her should she dare to touch them again she was often seen in the days that followed shedding bitter tears and watching over the sacred relics as they lay exposed on the ground the name of this widow was pepin and the scene of the sacrilege was a small enclosure on the hill of the moulin Avent. meantime the people in the faubourg des Borgata had invented a new sort of game or rather had resolved to vary the serious business of the drama that was being enacted by the introduction of comic scenes they had possessed themselves of a number of beetles such as washerwomen use and hammered in long nails the points of which projected an inch on the other side in the form of a fleur-de-lis every protestant who fell into their hands no matter what his age or rank was stamped with the bloody emblem serious wounds being inflicted in many cases murders were now becoming common amongst other names of victims mentioned were l'oriol bigot dumas lermet heretier domesson combe clairon pegomet pujat imbert vigal porchet vignole details more or less shocking came to light as to the manner in which the murderers went to work a man called d'albot was in the custody of two armed men some others came to consult with them d'albot appealed for mercy to the newcomers it was granted but as he turned to go he was shot dead another of the name of rambert tried to escape by disguising himself as a woman but was recognized and shot down a few yards outside his own door a gunner called saucina was walking in all security along the road to uza pipe in mouth when he was met by five men belonging to trestaillon's company who surrounded him and stabbed him to the heart with their knives the elder of two brothers named shiva ran across some fields to take shelter in a country house called rouvier which unknown to him had been occupied by some of the new national guard these met him on the threshold and shot him dead rant was seized in his own house and shot claw was met by a company and seeing trestaillon with whom he had always been friends in its ranks he went up to him and held out his hand whereupon trestaillon drew a pistol from his belt and blew his brains out calandre being chased down the rue de sur grisset sought shelter in a tavern but was forced to come out and was killed with sabres corbet was sent to prison under the escort of some men but these changed their mind on the way as to his punishment halted and shot him dead in the middle of the street a wine merchant called cabaneau who was flying from trestaillon ran into a house in which there was a venerable priest called cure bonhomme when the cutthroat rushed in all covered with blood the priest advanced and stopped him crying what will happen unhappy man when you come to the confessional with blood-stained hands pooh replied trestaillon you must put on your wide gown the sleeves are large enough to let everything pass to the short account given above of so many murders i will add the narrative of one to which i was an eyewitness and which made the most terrible impression on me of anything in my experience 
It was midnight. I was working beside my wife's bed. She was just becoming drowsy when a noise in the distance caught our attention. It gradually became more distinct, and drums began to beat the generale in every direction. Hiding my own alarm for fear of increasing hers, I answered my wife, who was asking what new thing was about to happen, that it was probably troops marching in or out of garrison. But soon reports of firearms, accompanied by an uproar with which we were so familiar that we could no longer mistake its meaning, were heard outside. Opening my window, I heard blood-curdling imprecations, mixed with cries of, Long live the king! going on. Not being able to remain any longer in this uncertainty, I woke a captain who lived in the same house. He rose, took his arms, and we went out together, directing our course towards the point whence the shouts seemed to come. The moon shone so bright that we could see everything almost as distinctly as in broad daylight. A concourse of people was hurrying towards the corps, yelling like madmen, the greater number of them half-naked, armed with muskets, swords, knives, and clubs, and swearing to exterminate everything, wave their weapons above the heads of men who had evidently been torn from their houses and brought to the square to be put to death. The rest of the crowd had, like ourselves, been drawn thither by curiosity and were asking what was going on. Murder is abroad, was the answer. Several people have been killed in the environs and the patrol has been fired on. While this questioning was going on, the noise continued to increase as I had really no business to be on a spot where such things were going on, and feeling that my place was at my wife's side to reassure her for the present, and to watch over her should the rioters come our way, I said good-bye to the captain, who went on to the barracks and took the road back to the suburb in which I lived. I was not more than fifty steps from our house when I heard loud talking behind me and turning, saw gun barrels glittering in the moonlight. As the speakers seemed to be rapidly approaching me, I kept close in the shadow of the houses till I reached my own door, which I laid softly to behind me, leaving myself a chink by which I could peep out and watch the movements of the group which was drawing near. Suddenly I felt something touch my hand. It was a great Corsican dog which was turned loose at night and was so fierce that it was a great protection to our house. I felt glad to have it at my side, for in case of a struggle it would be no despicable ally. Those approaching turned out to be three armed men leading a fourth, disarmed, and a prisoner. They all stopped just opposite my door, which I gently closed and locked, but as I still wished to see what they were about, I slipped into the garden, which lay towards the street, still followed by my dog. Contrary to his habit, and as if he understood the danger, he gave a low whine instead of his usual savage growl. I climbed into a fig tree, the branches of which overhung the street, and hidden by the leaves and resting my hands on the top of the wall, I leaned far enough forward to see what the men were about. They were still on the same spot, but there was a change in their positions. The prisoner was now kneeling with clasped hands before the cutthroats, begging for his life for the sake of his wife and children, in heart-rending accents, to which his executioners replied in mocking tones. "'We have got you at last into our hands, have we, you dog of a Bonapartist?' Why do you not call on your emperor to come and help you out of this scrape? The unfortunate man's entreaties became more pitiful and their mocking replies more pitiless. They leveled their muskets at him several times and then lowered them, saying, Devil take it! We won't shoot yet. Let us give him time to see death coming. Till at last the poor wretch, seeing there was no hope of mercy, begged to be put out of his misery. Drops of sweat stood on my forehead. I felt my pockets to see if I had nothing on me which I could use as a weapon, but I had not even a knife. I looked at my dog. He was lying flat at the foot of the tree and appeared to be a prey to the most abject terror. The prisoner continued his supplications and the assassins their threats and mockery. I climbed quietly down out of the fig tree, intending to fetch my pistols. My dog followed me with his eyes, which seemed to be the only living things about him. Just as my foot touched the ground, a double report rang out, and my dog gave a plaintive and prolonged howl. Feeling that all was over and that no weapons could be of any use, I climbed up again into my perch and looked out. The poor wretch was lying face downwards, writhing in his blood. The assassins were reloading their muskets as they walked away. Being anxious to see if it was too late to help the man whom I had not been able to save, 
I went out into the street and bent over him. He was bloody, disfigured, dying, but was yet alive, uttering dismal groans. I tried to lift him up, but soon saw that the wounds which he had received from bullets fire at close range were both mortal, one being in the head and the other in the loins. Just then a patrol of the National Guard turned round the corner of the street. This, instead of being a relief, awoke me to any sense of my danger, and feeling I could do nothing for the wounded man, for the death rattle had already begun, I entered my house, half shut the door, and listened. Qui vive? asked the corporal. Idiot, said someone else, to ask qui vive of a dead man. He is not dead, said a third voice. Listen to him singing. And indeed the poor fellow in his agony was giving utterance to dreadful groans. Someone has tickled him well, said a fourth. But what does it matter? We had better finish the job. Five or six musket shots followed and the groans ceased. The name of the man who had just expired was Louis Lecher. It was not against him, but against his nephew, that the assassins had had a grudge. But finding the nephew out when they burst into the house, and a victim being indispensable, they had torn the uncle from the arms of his wife, and dragging him towards the citadel, had killed him, as I have just related. Very early next morning I sent to three commissioners of police, one after the other, for permission to have the corpse carried to the hospital, but these gentlemen were either not up or had already gone out, so that it was not until eleven o'clock and after repeated applications that they condescended to give me the needed authorization. Thanks to this delay, the whole town came to see the body of the unfortunate man. Indeed, the day which followed a massacre was always kept as a holiday, everyone leaving his work undone and coming out to stare at the slaughtered victims. In this case, a man wishing to amuse the crowd took his pipe out of his mouth and put it between the teeth of the corpse, a joke which had a marvelous success, those present shrieking with laughter. Many murders had been committed during the night. The companies had scoured the streets, singing some doggerel, which one of the bloody wretches, being in poetic vein, had composed the chorus of which was, Our work's well done, we spare none. Seventeen fatal outrages were committed, and yet neither the reports of the firearms nor the cries of the victims broke the peaceful slumbers of Monsieur le Préfet and Monsieur le Commissaire General de la Police. But if the civil authorities slept, General Lagarde, who had shortly before come to town to take command of the city in the name of the king, was awake. He had sprung from his bed at the first shot, dressed himself and made a round of the posts. Then, sure that everything was in order, he had formed patrols of chasseurs, and had himself, accompanied by two officers only, gone wherever he heard cries for help. But in spite of the strictness of his orders, the small number of troops at his disposition delayed the success of his efforts, and it was not until three o'clock in the morning that he succeeded in securing Trestaillon. When this man was taken, he was dressed as usual in the uniform of the National Guard, with a cocked hat and captain's epaulettes. General Lagarda ordered the gendarmes, who made the capture to deprive him of his sword and carbine, but it was only after a long struggle that they could carry out this order, for Trestaillon protested that he would only give up his carbine with his life. However, he was at last obliged to yield to numbers, and when disarmed was removed to the barracks, but as there could be no peace in the town as long as he was in it, the general sent him to the citadel of Montpellier next morning before it was light. The disorders did not, however, cease at once. At eight o'clock a.m., they were still going on, the mob seeming to be animated by the spirit of Trestaillon, for while the soldiers were occupied in a distant quarter of the town, a score of men broke into the house of a certain Scipion Chebrer, who had remained hidden from his enemies for a long time, but who had lately returned home on the strength of the proclamations published by General Lagarde when he assumed the position of commandant of the town. He had indeed been sure that the disturbances in Nimes were over, when they burst out with redoubled fury on the 16th of October. On the morning of the 17th he was working quietly at home at his trade of a silk weaver, when alarmed by the shouts of a parcel of cutthroats outside his house, he tried to escape. He succeeded in reaching the coupe door, but the ruffians followed him, and the first who came up thrust him through the thigh with his bayonet. In consequence of this wound he fell from top to bottom of the staircase, was seized and dragged to the stables, where the assassins left him for dead, with seven wounds in his body. 
This was, however, the only murder committed that day in the town, thanks to the vigilance and courage of General Lagarde. The next day a considerable crowd gathered, and a noisy deputation went to General Lagarde's quarters, and insolently demanded that Trestaillon should be set at liberty. The general ordered them to disperse, but no attention was paid to this command, whereupon he ordered his soldiers to charge, and in a moment force accomplished what long-continued persuasion had failed to effect. Several of the ringleaders were arrested and taken to prison. Thus, as we shall see, the struggle assumed a new phase. Resistance to the royal power was made in the name of the royal power, and both those who broke or those who tried to maintain the public peace used the same cry, Long live the king! The firm attitude assumed by General Lagarde restored Nimes to a state of superficial peace, beneath which, however, the old enmities were fermenting. An occult power which betrayed itself by a kind of passive resistance neutralized the effect of the measures taken by the military commandant. He soon became cognizant of the fact that the essence of this sanguinary political strife was an hereditary religious animosity, and in order to strike a last blow at this he resolved, after having received permission from the king, to grant the general request of the Protestants by reopening their places of worship, which had been closed for more than four months and allowing the public exercise of the protestant religion which had been entirely suspended in the city for the same length of time formerly there had been six protestant pastors resident in nimes but four of them had fled the two who remained were monsieurs juliarat and olivier demont the first a young man twenty-eight years of age the second an old man of seventy the entire weight of the ministry had fallen during this period of proscription on monsieur juliarat who had accepted the task and religiously fulfilled it it seemed as if a special providence had miraculously protected him in the midst of the many perils which beset his path although the other pastor monsieur demont was president of the consistory his life was in much less danger for first he had reached an age which almost everywhere commands respect and then he had a son who was a lieutenant in one of the royal corps levied at Beaucaire, who protected him by his name when he could not do so by his presence. Monsieur de Mont had therefore little cause for anxiety as to his safety, either in the streets of Nimes or on the road between that and his country house. But as we have said, it was not so with Monsieur Julerat. Being young and active and having an unfaltering trust in God, on him alone devolved all the sacred duties of his office from the visitation of the sick and dying to the baptism of the newly born these latter were often brought to him at night to be baptized and he consented though unwillingly to make this concession feeling that if he insisted on the performance of the rite by day he would compromise not only his own safety but that of others in all that concerned him personally such as consoling the dying or caring for the wounded he acted quite openly and no danger that he encountered on his way ever caused him to flinch from the path of duty one day as monsieur Julerat was passing through the rue de barguette on his way to the prefecture to transact some business connected with his ministry he saw several men lying in wait in a blind alley by which he had to pass they had their guns pointed at him he continued his way with tranquil step and such an air of resignation that the assassins were overawed and lowered their weapons as he approached without firing a single shot when monsieur Gillerat reached the prefecture thinking that the prefect ought to be aware of everything connected with the public order he related this incident to monsieur d'arbal jacques but the latter did not think the affair of enough importance to require any investigation it was as will be seen a difficult enterprise to open once again the protestant places of worship which had been so long closed in present circumstances and in face of the fact that civil authorities regarded such a step with disfavor. But General Lagarda was one of those determined characters who always act up to their convictions. Moreover, to prepare people's minds for this stroke of religious policy, he relied on the help of the Duke d'Angoulême, who in the course of a tour through the south was almost immediately expected at Nimes. On the 5th of November, the prince made his entry into the city, and having read the reports of the general to the king Louis the Eighteenth and having received positive injunctions from his uncle to pacify the unhappy provinces which he was about to visit he arrived full of the desire to display whether he felt it or not a perfect impartiality so that when the delegates from the consistory were presented to him not only did he receive them most graciously but he was the first to speak of the interests of their faith 
assuring them that it was only a few days since he had learned with much regret that the religious services had been suspended since the sixteenth of july the delegates replied that in such a time of agitation the closing of their places of worship was a measure of prudence which they had felt ought to be borne and which had been borne with resignation the prince expressed his approval of this attitude with regard to the past but said that his presence was a guarantee for the future and that on thursday the ninth the two meeting-houses should be reopened and restored to their proper use the protestants were alarmed at having a favour according to them which was much more than they would have dared to ask and for which they were hardly prepared but the prince reassured them by saying that all needful measures would be taken to provide against any breach of the public peace and at the same time invited monsieur de mont president and monsieur roland lacoste member of the consistory to dine with him the next deputation to arrive was a catholic one and its object was to ask that Tressaillon might be set at liberty. The prince was so indignant at this request that his only answer was to turn his back on those who proffered it. The next day the duke, accompanied by General Lagarde, left for Montpellier, and as it was on the latter that the Protestants placed their sole reliance for the maintenance of those rights, guaranteed for the future by the word of the prince, they hesitated to take any new step in his absence, and let the ninth of november go by without attempting to resume public worship preferring to wait for the return of their protector which took place on saturday evening the eleventh of november when the general got back his first thought was to ask if the commands of the prince had been carried out and when he heard that they had not without waiting to hear a word on justification of the delay he sent a positive order to the president of the consistory to open both places of worship the next morning upon this the president carrying self-abnegation and prudence to their extreme limits went to the general's quarters and having warmly thanked him laid before him the dangers to which he would expose himself by running counter to the opinions of those who had had their own way in the city for the last four months but general lagarda brushed all these considerations aside he had received an order from the prince and to a man of his military cast of mind no course was open but to carry that order out nevertheless the president again expressed his doubts and fears i will answer with my head said the general that nothing happens still the president counseled prudence asking that only one place of worship at first be opened and to this the general gave his consent this continued resistance to the re-establishment of public worship on the part of those who most eagerly desired it enabled the general at last to realize the extent of the danger which would be incurred by the carrying out of this measure and he at once took all possible precautions under the pretext that he was going to have a general review he brought the entire civil and military forces of nimes under his authority determined if necessary to use the one to suppress the other as early as eight o'clock in the morning a guard of gendarmes was stationed at the doors of the meeting-house while other members of the same force took up their positions in the adjacent streets on the other hand the consistory had decided that the doors were to be opened an hour sooner than usual that the bells were not to be rung and that the organ should be silent these precautions had both a good and a bad side the gendarmes at the door of the meeting-house gave if not a promise of security at least a promise of support but they showed to the citizens of the other party what was about to be done so before nine o'clock groups of catholics began to form and as it happened to be sunday the inhabitants of the neighboring villages arriving constantly by twos and threes soon united these groups into a little army thus the streets leading to the church being thronged the protestants who pushed their way through were greeted with insulting remarks and even the president of the consistory whose white hair and dignified expression had no effect upon the mob heard the people round him saying these brigands of protestants are going again to their temple but we shall soon give them enough of it the anger of the populace soon grows hot between the first bubble and the boiling point the interval is short threats spoken in a low voice were soon succeeded by noisy objurgations women children and men break out into yells down with the broilers for this was one of the names by which the protestants were designated down with the broilers we do not want to see them using our churches let them give us back our churches let them give us back our churches and go into the desert out with them out with them to the desert 
to the desert as the crowd did not go beyond words however insulting and as the protestants were long inured to much worse things they plodded along to their meeting-house humble and silent and went in undeterred by the displeasure they arose whereupon the service commenced but some catholics went in with them and soon the same shouts which had been heard without were heard also within the general however was on the alert and as soon as the shouts arose inside the gendarmes entered the church and arrested those who had caused the disturbance the crowds tried to rescue them on their way to prison but the general appeared at the head of imposing forces at the sight of which they desisted an apparent cam succeeded the tumult and the public worship went on without further interruption the general misled by appearances went off himself to attend a military mass and at eleven o'clock returned to his quarters for lunch his absence was immediately perceived and taken advantage of in the twinkling of an eye the crowds which had dispersed gathered together in even greater numbers and the protestants seeing themselves once more in danger shut the doors from within while the gendarmes guarded them without the populace pressed so closely round the gendarmes and assumed such a threatening attitude that fearing he and his men would not be able to hold their own in such a throng the captain ordered monsieur delbos one of his officers to ride off and warn the general he forced his way through the crowd with great trouble and went off at a gallop on seeing this the people felt there was no time to be lost they knew of what kind the general was and that he would be on the spot in a quarter of an hour a large crowd is invincible through its numbers it has only to press forward and everything gives way men wood iron at this moment the crowd swayed by a common impulse swept forward the gendarmes and their horses were crushed against the wall doors gave way and instantly with a tremendous roar a living wave flooded the church cries of terror and frightful imprecations were heard on all sides every one made a weapon of whatever came to hand chairs and benches were hurled about the disorder was at its height it seemed as if the days of the michelada and the bagara were about to return when suddenly the news of a terrible event was spread abroad and assailants and assailed paused in horror general lagarda had just been assassinated as the crowd had foreseen no sooner did the messenger deliver his message than the general sprang on his horse and being too brave or perhaps too scornful to fear such foes he waited for no escort but accompanied by two or three officers set off at full gallop towards the scene of the tumult he had passed through the narrow streets which led to the meeting-house by pushing the crowd aside with his horse's chest when just as he got out into the open square a young man named Boisson, a sergeant in the nimes national guard came up and seemed to wish to speak to him the general seeing a man in uniform bent down without a thought of danger to listen to what he had to say whereupon boisson drew a pistol out and fired at him the ball broke the collarbone and lodged in the neck behind the carotid artery and the general fell from his horse the news of this crime had a strange and unexpected effect however excited and frenzied the crowd was it was instantly realized the consequences of this act it was no longer like the murder of marshal brune at avignon or general ramel at toulouse an act of vengeance on a favorite of napoleon but open and armed rebellion against the king it was not a simple murder it was high treason a feeling of the utmost terror spread through the town only a few fanatics went on howling in the church which the protestants fearing still greater disasters had by this time resolved to abandon the first to come out was president olivier de Mont, accompanied by monsieur valong who had only just arrived in the city but who had immediately hurried to the spot at the call of duty monsieur juliot his two children in his arms walked behind them followed by all the other worshippers at first the crowd threatening and ireful hooted and threw stones at them but at the voice of the mayor and the dignified aspect of the president they allowed them to pass during this strange retreat over eighty protestants were wounded but not fatally except a young girl called jeannette cornelier who had been so beaten and ill-used that she died of her injuries a few days later in spite of the momentary slackening of energy which followed the assassination of general lagarda the catholics did not remain long in a state of total inaction during the rest of the day the excited populace seemed as if shaken by an earthquake about six o'clock in the evening some of the most desperate characters in the town possessed themselves of a hatchet and taking their way to the protestant church smashed the doors tore the pastor's gowns 
rifled the poor box, and pulled the books to pieces. A detachment of troops arrived just in time to prevent their setting the building on fire. The next day passed more quietly. This time the disorders were of too important a nature for the prefect to ignore, as he had ignored so many bloody acts in the past, so in due time a full report was laid before the king. It became known the same evening that General Lagarda was still living, and that those around him hoped that the wound would not prove mortal. Dr. Delpech, who had been summoned from Montpellier, had succeeded in extracting the bullet, and though he spoke no word of hope, he did not expressly declare that the case was hopeless. Two days later everything in the town had assumed its ordinary aspect, and on the 21st of November the king issued the following edict. Louis, by the grace of God, King of France, and of Navarre, to all those to whom these presents shall come, greeting. An abominable crime has cast a stain on our city of Nimes. A seditious mob has dared to oppose the opening of the Protestant place of worship in contempt of the constitutional charter, which, while it recognizes the Catholic religion as the religion of the state, guarantees to the other religious bodies protection and freedom of worship. Our military commandant, whilst trying to disperse these crowds by gentle means before having resort to force, was shot down, and his assassin has till now successfully evaded the arm of the law. If such an outrage were to remain unpunished, the maintenance of good government and public order would be impossible, and our ministers would be guilty of neglecting the law. Wherefore we have ordered and do order as follows. Article 1 proceedings shall be commenced without delay by our attorney and the attorney general against the perpetrator of the murderous attack on the person of sieur lagarde and against the authors instigators and accomplices of the insurrection which took place in the city of nimes on the twelfth of the present month article two a sufficient number of troops shall be quartered in the said city and shall remain there at the cost of the inhabitants until the assassin and his accomplices have been produced before a court of law article three all those citizens whose names are not entitled to be on the roll of the national guard shall be disarmed our keeper of the seals our minister of war our minister of the interior and our minister of police are entrusted with the execution of this edict given at paris at our castle of the tuileries on the twenty first of november in the year of grace eighteen fifteen and of our reign the twenty first signed louis boissin was acquitted this was the last crime committed in the south and it led fortunately to no reprisals three months after the murderous attempt to which he had so nearly fallen a victim general lagarde left nimes with the rank of ambassador and was succeeded as prefect by monsieur d'argent during the firm just and independent administration of the latter the disarming of the citizens decreed by the royal edict was carried out without bloodshed through his influence messieurs chabot latour saint aulaire and lascour were elected to the chamber of deputies in place of messieurs de calviere de vogue and de trinquelade and down to the present time the name of monsieur d'argent is held in veneration at nimes as if he had only quitted the city yesterday end of chapter nine recording by john van stan savannah georgia end of celebrated crimes volume two the massacres of the south by alexander dumas